John Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're doing another episode of Hell Talk. Now that the end of the Jamie Delano run has been reached, uh, it's the first main run of that. And today, of course, as always, I have my co-host, Hoku. How are you doing, Hoku? Hi, everybody. I'm doing good. Just enjoying getting my head around all the crazy shit that's happened in these past few issues. Yeah, maybe you can explain to me what happened, because... <laughs> I'm still a little bit fuzzy on exactly what was going on, but you know, that's, that's Jamie think, Delano. Yeah. He, he really, like you've said, he puts forth really great ideas, but doesn't quite give you enough to understand them completely. Yeah. I think, you know, last episode when I said that it was like uh, the, probably the most uh, in, insightful thing I've ever said about Jamie Delano's writing. Like, <laughs> because after I said it, I was like, Oh yeah. Like that is it. Like, he doesn't quite, he's got a lot of cool ideas, but it doesn't, I can never quite like grab it, you know, like I can never get my head around it, you know? So, uh, so yeah, we, we, for this uh, episode, we read issues or we listened to issues 30, 32 through 40 and, uh, which is the last eight issues of the run. And we got a couple, like a lot of little story arcs in this one. It's not one solid one, uh, like you were saying before we were recording, uh, so just generally, what did you think of this little little run here? I really enjoyed the little bites that he yeah. kept this up to. I think it, it overall it makes you feel like you're getting more out of fewer issues because this was what, only like eight issues yeah, or eight so? Eight issues, yeah. And isn't that how long Fear Machine was? Fear Machine's nine. Nine. So like I feel like I got more out of these eight issues than the entirety of Fear Machine just from the different characters that we met, the different plot points that got, you know, finished and cleaned up nicely. Like a few little stray tags here and there, which is always great because that means hopefully they'll use it again or do something with them. Right. But overall, I really enjoyed this whole set of issues as like you, you wouldn't even need to technically call it a, a, a chunk of like the full story because there's like almost four different stories within these issues. So I really enjoyed that we got a lot more movement from the story than being bogged down by a single storyline with like little threads here, the way um, some of the other ones have been. So I don't know if that was an artistic choice for them to say, hey, can you just like shorten it to like one or two issues per idea? <laughs> or if he just naturally did this after himself doing like all that with Fear Machine and Family Man and being like, you know what, I could do some short stories now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he wrote this one uh, or like these stories. I, like, I I wonder if he knew like I'm ending, like my run is going to end at forty, so like I want to get this like Magus storyline wrapped in there, but also I want to tell these other little side stories. And one of them is actually a fill-in issue, issue thirty-two. The first one we're going to talk about is um, is the dog issue, <laughs> the the infamous Red dog the issue. Dog. Yeah, and so like that one's written. It says. It says Jamie Delano on the cover, I think, or something. But then on the inside, it says Doug Foreman or Dick, uh, Dick Foreman, I think. I can't remember. I can't remember what his name is, but the guy who fills in on like all Swamp Thing and Hellblazer issues uh, whenever they need like a little extra run or a little extra issue in between. Um, I wonder if it's like they give him an idea of like, hey, so I have this idea for a story. I just don't have time to write it. Can you kind of fiddle with it? And then he pops these gems out. Yeah, it's just weird individual stories that they're like i'm thinking something about a possessed dog just just run with it he's just like oh yeah i got that <laughs> that makes sense because it i think they do like credit him as like a writer on it as well like jamie so i'm like okay maybe maybe like you said it was like plotted and then dick just was like okay i'll do all the words and like some of the other story beats or something but uh either way i like this one a lot i thought that, <laughs> i think this one's like a fun yeah. one and I think uh, John <laughs> is very, like, funny in this one. Um, I do think the premise is a little silly, like, uh, specifically how he defeats the dog. <laughs> um, oh, and, like, yeah. Just... 
yeah how he pepper or what was it well there was pepper but then also he like uh he happened to see dogs playing in the park earlier that morning or whatever and saw how like the alpha would like not attack a dog if he uh, laid down on his belly so he was like all i gotta do is lay down on my belly and i'm like your Tony, he thought of it in. sooner and he wouldn't have had to go through all that running and hiding. And I know. <laughs> well, then, <laughs> then we wouldn't have an issue, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But uh, but yeah, he I, I like the way like he does have to run and he's trying to get out of the situation. And it makes sense because it's like, what do you I mean, your first thought when a giant killer dog is chasing you is not like I'm going to r- roll over on my tummy or on my back and right. s- reveal my stomach so that the instincts will kick in and he won't kill me. And so, um, that is like the only little, little, little silly thing, but I, I let it go. It is comics at some point, you know, and you go, mm-hmm. like, all right, well I've read crazier stuff or like sillier stuff than that for endings to things. So, um, and it is a fill in issue. So I always give those like a little, uh, like a pass on certain things. Cause you're like, someone's got to come in and try to like fill in an issue in the middle of this run and you know of course it's it's got to fill in but it can't really tie into anything and because who knows what the writer wants to do after that and then (laughs) it's just you know you're trying to craft a story in one issue that's pretty hard but i think uh, it was pretty successful with this one i agree i think that it fits fine it has you know the beginning middle and end it's both fits in with the storyline, but also if you take it out, it doesn't really affect anything around it. So, it, although like they said, do mention dogs, filler. like the, there's one. Oh, that's right. The joke later with the, where he's like, I'm so sick and tired of dogs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love that callback. Because if you're going to have, funny. you know, it's nice that Jamie Delano would call back to a fill in issue, right? But that, that is pretty funny. Maybe yeah. he just really liked that the way that story came out and was like, you know what? I'm going to. I'm gonna put a little little in there for for him. <laughs> now it's it. canon because I mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's you know that's one of those things I never think about it because you know every run of American comics has like fill-ins and sometimes those mm-hmm. writers they try to go big they try to make their stamp on that character and a lot of the times that shit just gets forgotten in the past because no one ever mentions it again. So, like, technically it is canon because it's in the run or whatever. But if no one ever mentions it again, then it's not really, you know, like, like technically it is. But no one's going to count it as canon. They're going to be like, oh, that was this one fill in writer, this one issue that no one ever brings up. So it's not really canon. Um, But it's but because Jamie Delano calls back to it. Now it's canon. He definitely fought that dog. And uh, I like I appreciate that. I kind of wanted like a writer later on to pick the story back up because you know at the end there's like the rat that's possessed so or they insinuate that the rat is possessed so it's like they could have someone could have picked up a storyline where he's got to fight a giant rat or whatever (laughs) or like figure that out or there's something going on with these rats and you know uh spin off of that becomes king rat and gets a bunch of rats like uh what what was what's that play or that um, ballet nutcracker the nutcracker you know king rat with all his well, rats. that's basically what this is—the dog, right? He becomes king dog, and then gets all the dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. It, it actually reminded me of uh, one of Clyde Barker's stories from *Book of Bloods*, where same kind of idea is that, although I don't think necessarily that the character uses magic or anything, but just that there is this one story he has about uh, a police detective who has to go to this like boys reform school to be Mm. a teacher and one of the kids has disappeared and they don't know what happened to him and i'll spoil it a little bit just because i won't give away the full ending but there's also this like giant pig out back in a sty that the kids are supposed to take care of these farm animals as part of their rehabilitation one of the kids like killed himself and then let the the pig eat him so that he could then put his spirit in the pig. So mm. really messed up story. But that was, to me, it struck a similar chord of just the idea of like human possessing an animal. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've grown to not trust anybody who owns a lot of pigs. Cause I know that they could just <laughs> kill someone and throw them in the pen and the pigs will eat them. So, you know, if you're looking for bodies and someone has a pig farm, I think, you know, where you'll find them. So, also dogs, all yes. a watchman. So. Oh yeah, that's true. 
Yeah. Um, but I think I've seen a lot more media with pigs doing it than uh, than dogs. Although I'm sure you know you could train a dog to eat them. But uh, but yeah. So I thought that issue was pretty <laughs> fun. Um, and then the next issue is the one I'm like, what is what? <laughs> Like out of nowhere, it's the one that's like Sundays are different, and it's just like yeah, John has a nice Sunday. Trippy, yeah. Or does he? Oh yeah, or does he? Who I knows? Mean, is this normal? Is this a normal Sunday for him, where the world just goes topsy turvy and he jumps into a slightly different dimension and then just readjusts himself? Because I mean, he does that every Sunday, just jumps into a new dimension. Well, it was such a trippy thing. I could never figure out if it was if it meant to be like this is normal for him. Or it's like Sunday, I can't trust what happens, meaning something weird just happens every Sunday. Or, right. or any day he tries to be all, I'm going to like move on, I'm going to be normal, I'm going to be a nice guy. And for some reason that upsets the universe. And, and <laughs> Like like the him. universe won't let him be a nice guy. He's got to be a dick. Exactly. Because <laughs> that is how God or whoever wants him to be. Uh, that's a funny idea. For me, the whole second half of this issue is a dream, like a fever dream, because he, he ate bad mm. food or whatever and he had... Uh, food poisoning and I just imagined him sitting on the toilet passed out you know with his face against the uh, the graffiti that he like started messing with the le- the letters and stuff um, so I like yeah I just imagined him just like pass out in there just having this crazy dream because he ha- ate the bad food um, but yeah like it's such a weird I one I hope so yeah yeah right I had no idea because my idea is like way worse <laughs> Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, like, oh, sometimes he just goes to another dimension. <laughs> but the reason I don't think it's that is because he never does it again or anything, right? So it's just kind of like, it's it's weird because it's written by Jamie Delano, but it feels like a fill-in issue because it's never yeah. like, referenced again and it's just kind of a one-off. Um, and he doesn't have many of those, even like the ones you think are, like um, was issue 23, the one where he like hangs out with his friend, um that sets up the whole the dead guy. Yeah. Yeah. The, no. Oh, the, that one. No, not, not the dead guy one. The one that we're, it's the, the literary guy. I can't remember his name. Jehoshaphat oh, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Where like, you know, that could have been a, a one off, but then he like continues it into the family man story arc. So it's like, okay. Like you kind of needed that for setup, but this, there's no reason to have it. Right. There's nothing that happens afterwards to say whether he like either got back to our universe or like you said, if it was just a, a fever dream brought on by, by stomach pains and, and food poisoning. Yeah. He didn't like wake up in the stall the next day or something. He just, it just like the story continued after that as a, plus the, 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 like you said, the nod at the end of, of the issue where he kind of almost looks at the camera, you said, yeah, he like winks like, at us as the wings. So then even more so it's like, wait, so, He's breaking the fourth wall right there. Is that also part of his dream? Or is that, again, just a normal Sunday thing where the universe just fits him out somewhere weird? And he's just like, well, I guess I'll get back to reality when I get back to reality. I don't know. (laughs) It's weird enough, and it never happens any other time in the series, even in Jamie Delano's run. So I'm like, I don't know. Maybe Jamie just wanted to tell this weird one-off story and was like, I'll put it here. And then, because then, you know, if he knows he's wrapping it up, you know, and he's only got eight issues, it's like, okay, well, I'll use these two. You know, we got the dog story, then we got my one weird story, then we, you know, get into the meat and potatoes, which I thought is interesting. You have um, an issue, the next issue, I can't remember which, oh, the Boogeyman is the name of that one. And it's like John finding Marge and Mercury again from the Fear Machine story. And immediately in my head, I was like, oh, I know Hoku doesn't like the Fear Machine story arc, so I wonder if <laughs> she's going to like them coming back or, like, fear, fearing it. Like, oh, my God, is this going to be another Fear Machine? Like, <laughs> I liked them as characters. It was the story that they were put in that was not my favorite. But I enjoyed them as characters, and I hoped I would see them in. Kind of like how Zed came back in that one as well. Right. From previous ones. I was like, oh, cool. I hope that means that they'll also continue to come back. Because I like seeing them continue to use characters they have previously, especially if they're still alive, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> it's nice to know that there's some people who don't die after meeting John for the first time. Or, you know. Some people. Having there's, met there him in. <laughs> yeah, like, it happens a lot, not to mention also people who, like, they bring in, and it's like, oh, we've been super long friends for a long time, and you're like, oh, shit, they, they're meeting John again, which means they're probably going to die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had that feeling of, oh, they're back. Oh, or does that mean they're going to die because they're meeting up with him again? <laughs> Right. And and this one, 
uh, is a kind of a hard issue to read because John is such a sleaze bag in it. Like he comes to them, he finds them like where they're at with their camper. And then he comes to them and he's just, he just wants to fuck Marge, but like, he's got to like go around her like defenses. So he's, he's got to be like manipulator. And yeah, it's like a, I, I know it's hard because he's like the hero, right? He's like the care, the main character of the story. Um, but like, you don't like him as the reader. At least I don't, I don't <laughs> in this, especially in this issue. Um, I feel yeah. like he does get better depending on who's writing him sometimes, but Jamie Delano really likes to keep him in the muck, you know? Um, anti-hero, I think would be a better way to yeah. describe him. Cause anti-heroes are allowed to do bad things sometimes. Yeah. He's definitely an anti-hero. Good. Just sometimes yeah. he goes in the more like, like even if he's an anti-hero, generally he's not like a horrible person. That's, manipulating women or making them like, yeah he's like making her feel bad in order to like get what he wants it's it's, it's very like like bad um and also you hear like like mercury is being affected by it she's sitting outside feeling all of this um manipulation that he's doing and like what her sister's feeling about it so she has to live it too because she's psychic so yeah so he's hurting both of them just yeah. because he wants to feel better yeah and it's like it's a weird issue for like the character. What do you think about that? Uh, it was icky for sure. Uh, I didn't particularly like John in that issue. Wanted to slap him quite a few times. Actually, right. yeah, you want <laughs> you want have. Marge to hit him or something. <laughs> Leave them alone, you asshole! Haven't they been through enough? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like Here you just come in to like disrupt their lives just because you're feeling sorry for yourself again. Yeah it's yeah it's it's one of those things it's i don't know it, it's one of the worst uh issues for john i think as a character i'm sure like i mean there's 300 issues of this run i'm sure or of the mm-hmm. series i'm sure he gets even lower than that but generally he doesn't he doesn't um treat women badly or other people usually too bad other than not not on purpose not on purpose usually usually not on purpose this I, is one of those times where he chose to kind of be a smarmy asshole and play on her you know her her heartstrings and and get from her what he wanted without any regard for how he might be hurting her yeah or or you know either of them yeah really. mercury either yeah so 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 i was actually i didn't mind so much when uh the next morning in the next issue when you know, Mercury kind of just oh, messed yeah. with his mind afterwards. I was like, you know, you kind of deserve that. Yeah, it's you're an harsh, asshole. But you were kind of a dick that night. And whether you meant it or not, we kind of get the feeling you did because you were in, you were still semi sober enough to know what you were doing was wrong. And in his head, at least we got those thoughts of like, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Kind of feeling. Yeah. So when she's just like, hey, so I'm going to kind of just throw your death at you. I was kind of like, you know, you 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 kind of deserve that a little bit. I don't think he'll die. Obviously, he can't die because this is his series. Not na- not yet, anyway. I don't know. Maybe he dies at some point. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil issue <laughs> 300 for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But at least at this point, I was like, I know there's issues after this. So you can't die here. So this is just going to be sort of hopefully a wake-up call for you to to confront your potential death and, and just, you know, know that you kind of deserve it in this moment. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, I really like that issue, too, where Mercury gets him back for the night before. And it's interesting because we have this old man, John, right? And then we see this post-apocalyptic future. And it seems like this is actually the real future that John is looking at. Because later on in the last two issues, they show what the like alternate dimension Magus, the golden boy Magus, lived through. And he didn't have that post-apocalyptic future the same way. At least he didn't get killed by sharks. Everything was all good. So it's like, oh, this might have been like the real future for John uh, that she showed him because she's so like magical or whatever. She has like that. She's got the shin in, we'll call it. So Yeah. <laughs> Almost like she was able to take his consciousness, consciousness and just literally throw it into the future where she knew at some point, you know, it ends yeah. for him. So almost like time travel and this issue is a really i mean it's really low-key sets up all the stuff that happens in those last two issues with the golden boy magus because um you see john is an old man in this and he's alone everybody's dead the world is dying and he's he can't do anything about it he's like 
used all of his friends until there's none of them left and and he can't even get out of you know the world being ending because it's the world being in, ended so um he just you know he's gonna get either killed by dogs or killed by sharks he's got to choose so so uh and that's like a good setup for like the last two issues where it's like um we get to see the golden boy as a old man like the golden magus and it's like Oh, he's got all his friends with him and they all love him. And he's had, I think he's had kids with all the women or something too, or at least Mercury, I think. It sounded like he had kids with Mercury's daughter, which is really creepy, but very culty. So I, yeah, I kind of yeah. figuring that's what was going on there. It sounds like he created a cult of all his closest friends and they're living in some kind of convent paradise, yes. even though the world has kind of experienced what it did in his other in the other vision yeah sea levels rising and whatnot but he managed to keep his friends safe they fully believe in him as you do with the cult leader so yeah he's probably had his way with quite a few i mean as i don't all think the mercury, cult though. mercury had her had her husband or, or whatever but it That's was her true. daughter yes that they said that in they inferred <laughs> that was john's kids and that i was just like <laughs> Well, you know, like yeah, all, all cult leaders, you, you got to sleep with everybody's <laughs> wife. I think that's part of He's the... the golden child, but apparently he still has no scruples about, you know, sleeping around. Hey, if they're <laughs> adults and they can make their own choices, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> but that was practically being like, Grandpa John. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he tastes like oh, cigarettes. Like a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah <laughs> yeah no i get it i get it you know i i would be down for any john of any time but you know that's just me so uh <laughs> but yeah and then uh so like that that was a fun issue where kind of it like you don't know it but it sets up like the juxtaposition for those last two issues which i like after reading the last two issues you think back oh yeah he was old in that other one a couple issues back and so either at the time i'm like oh this is an interesting issue but it actually does a lot of work for the future issues so i like that one um and then we get uh a creepy look at little creepy john as a boy in the dead boy's heart issue which i that's the one i remember the most from this run like usually when i when i would think back on this whole run like all of jamie delano's issues it would be like the first issues where i'd be like oh that was were fucked up and then for some reason this would stick in my head where it's like john's a weird creepy kid and it's the 60s and he's uh you know going around trying to be cool and hang out with the, the older boys and he gets he finds a, a rock and he's just like it's a heart and I, I i think it's because i being a young boy at one time used to do this shit all the time where i would just like you just you know you pick up a rock you're like it's an arrowhead and it's not at all but like your little kid mind projects you know some cool thing on it um i was actually I, wondering if you were gonna say some sort of like connection to your childhood that was that would be why it stands out so much to you yeah I, that that I <laughs> like, mean, did you collect rocks and call them dead boy hearts did you <laughs> <laughs> no and i didn't kill bugs with them either thank you hoku i'm not a creepy <laughs> in, kid. in your bl bug gladiator you know i actually used to at the beach um get hermit crab or little little hermit crabs little sand crabs and put them all in my own version of a gladiator ring and make them uh yeah. and put a new shell in there so that they would fight each other for the new shell. kill each other for me that's what you used to say. <laughs> no it's just <laughs> them displacing each other for who gets the best shell oh okay <laughs> they don't tear each other apart okay that's good no no no. it's just one of them like i think pokes at the other one till it leaves the shell and then he jumps in yeah they're still alive I mean, if you want to be cruel, you can take away the extra shell. So then there's one of them running out without a shell and then it's naked and, and <laughs> easy to eat. But, you know, for some predator to get. But that would only be if you were cruel. I would always make sure there was enough shells to go around. Yeah, so I was through in like a new shell. So they jump around and be like, oh, new shell. Awesome. But yes, yeah, so that part, um, not so much the killing bugs part. But yeah, definitely that sort of like animal, that feeling of being a kid and kind of like, I have the power to make them do what I want with yeah. little creatures and stuff. So. Yeah. yeah i also i like, was also a weird child <laughs> i also like the idea of like you know he's trying to impress the older kids so he like he goes to get the nudie magazine i thought that was funny because that's mm -hmm. such a uh i mean that doesn't happen anymore right because porn is so prevalent on the internet or whatever so like you don't need to 
walk into the woods and hope there's a stump with a playboy that's torn apart inside of it or something you know so like that's what kids used to do back in the day apparently and uh, i never did that because yeah that i was even that before my time technology yeah <laughs> but like i mean it's just really weird uh like to see to see john as like a little kid that's all fucking creepy and stuff uh and then also it also sets up what happens in issues uh 39 and 40 where you realize oh this is the sickly boy right like john is the sickly not supposed to live one and so that's why he's so creepy and weird uh even though that's not really kind of brought up in the in the issue itself like i think that's inferred by what they say in those later issues when he's born um uh, I can see that. Like the sickliness is not just his physical stuff, but also in his mind. He's yeah. just not normal. <laughs> yeah. And also he, like he's like thrown in to situations where people are being really creepy and weird, like adults. Like the creepiest thing in this issue to me is where he, he stumbles upon the uh the couple making out and about to have sex and then the woman is like, No, I don't want to, but the guy's like, Whatever, I'll do what I want and then and then John comes up on them and she's like, Oh my God, there's a boy watching us. And then she gets up to him and goes, you like what you see you like boy. And I'm like, Oh, that's so weird and creepy. Especially since she was just about to get raped. Uh, like, yeah, that's like messed up. she does like a similar thing to John, you know, like that's such a weird thing to do. And I guess, cause you know, he's only like eight or nine or something in that, I think. So, um, yeah, it's just like that's the cre- one of the creepiest parts of that issue, and there's a lot of creepy parts in that issue. Did you have a creepy part that you thought was extra creepy? Well, I didn't particularly um, like when he had to hide, and it was like he just happened to pick the bush where the homeless man did his business. And, and oh, that was gross. yeah, that's gross. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just gross. And then he's like, "No, I have to stay here because somebody might find me, so I'm just gonna sit here and count my heartbeats." <laughs> yeah that that is creepy you're right about that i also the thought it was creepy. with the heartbeats was also weird yes that's what i was i also thought it was creepy how like that night when he's sitting in his bed he's just like rubbing the stone on him and it, mm. it reminded me of like um like some cultures have like if you rub like an egg on you when you feel bad the egg will like absorb the bad energy or whatever and then like you put it under your bed and then you go to sleep and then it will in the morning it will be spoiled or rotten or whatever and that then you will feel good because like the egg took on the sickness Um, oh my gosh that totally just reminded me i don't know if you ever used to see those old commercials where you put those things on your feet overnight and then in the morning they'd be black because they pulled all the toxins out of your body (laughs) what what nonsense is this (laughs) I know, like the infomercials, they used to be like these, like these are healing like pads that you put on your feet while you're sleeping, and then you take them off in the morning, and they're all black because they pulled all the toxins out of your body. And it, I know, it was just something stupid, like it's, it's, you know, like vinegar or something that just turns black by x amount of time, right? After being exposed to air or whatever. But I just remember seeing those as a kid, and that definitely connects with the whole like all the toxins and, and horrible pains and it hurts will be hurts will be pulled out of my body by this magic rock. And I just, just thought of that old infomercial for some reason. That makes sense. But also like it is what a little boy thinks, right? Like a little, little kid, they don't know how the world works. And they, and if, if you believe in this thing so much, like there's a lots of stories that start like that, you know, like even, you know, the Indian in the cupboard or, you know, things like that, where it's like, Oh, I, I have this idea as a child, I do it, and oh my god, it, magic happens, you know? So, like, I get why he would do it. It's just really weird to think, he got this rock, he thinks it's someone's heart. He literally thinks mm-hmm. it is a boy's heart. And then he's, like, rubbing it on his face and stuff. <laughs> it, it is creepy. sort of that connection of, like, a weird connection of, uh, like, this magic rock heart found me in a way and therefore it is my talisman and therefore it can do all these things that i'm saying in my head like it can do it can absorb the power of bugs it can heal my aches and bruises and cuts and yeah he has a very like weird imagination yeah (laughs) to go specifically in those directions not just for me it would be oh pretty rock I'm going to put that on my dresser because I like pretty rocks. It's no, this rock is magical and has these magic properties. And every time he, you know, looks at the rock or he's like, and it can also do this. 
And if I bleed on it, it's, what was it, when he, like, put his blood on the rock? Uh-huh. It's like somehow that empowered the rock even more or something like that. Yeah, it's blood magic now. <laughs> yeah. It's creepy. Yeah, it's Very creepy. creepy kid. There's that that's creepy. <laughs> and then also, like, the aunt and uncle situation is creepy where, like, she's tied up or something. It's some weird thing that's going on sexually Weird bondage with thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, some bondage stuff for sure. But it does not seem legit bondage because that's consensual. So that's just... Yeah, it seems like the wife is just doing it because the, the husband wants to. Power trips. Yeah. In the name of like, let's, let's, let's do some fun. Yeah, let's do some fun stuff that I think is fun. And I don't think it's it's fun for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is weird. But then, like, I love her reaction when he's like, oh, you want to rub this rock, this gross fucking yeah. rock on your wounds? And she's like, <laughs> ugh, get that fucking thing away from me. <laughs> I thought that was ugh. really funny when I read it. Uh, I'm actually surprised after learning, like, well, not only how much older his sister is than him, I didn't realize they had that much of an age yet, mm-hmm. but the fact that she still will go to him, because I'm sure this is only the tip of the iceberg of weird shit she has had to deal with with John, but they're still on semi-good terms. That would be a little hard to imagine. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, like... you know, even as an adult, hearing the weird shit he gets into as an adult, but starting from being a child, the fact that she didn't, like, cut ties completely is is good on her i guess for still thinking well he's my brother i should keep in touch yeah i guess you know yeah they never say like he ever did anything really bad around her necessarily but it's just yeah there's enough weird shit going on you would think she'd be like i'm gonna stay away from him but it's her he might turn into a serial killer i i don't know if i should like keep in close contact with him (laughs) but she still seems pretty nice well, nice you got to stay on his good like, side so oh. he doesn't murder you. Yeah. <laughs> or put a curse on you that connects to a cat, a, a dead cat. Or oh, something. good God. Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> she probably didn't know about that or she, she would have cut ties, I'm sure. Oh, I would imagine. I would imagine. But, <laughs> um. So, yeah. And then, so that issue, I, I like those two issues together. Like, they, they, they're like one kind of solid story that gives you a little bit about John's future and past. And then they set you up for like alternate realities and how John got there in those late later two issues. But in between those two storylines, we get this, uh, I think this is a horrific storyline personally, which is why we even did these issues for Halloween, a couple issues or a couple Halloweens ago. Um, in the main podcast, I remember reading these and these stuck with me too. Just the horrificness of the dad, like how horrible he is. And just the the way it ends, I was always like, "What the fuck?" Like, <laughs> so I think I vaguely recall that. Yeah, it was still enough that I I didn't recognize it when the story came up. So if I listened to it, it was probably just once when you first came out, and it didn't really I didn't really surface the memories of oh, it's this story. Maybe it was so bad that I just like horrific that I blocked it out, and so it was like reading it all over again. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, when me and John do it, we kind of do like a general overview of stuff. And then when I do it, I'm reading like the actual issue. So um, maybe maybe it didn't sit in your mind like like it would now. But um, but yeah, that whole stuff with the kid Martin and I mean, obviously, the pretense for it's kind of weak where it's just like Mercury told us to drive this way. And so we did. But like, I guess she needs to help somebody. Yeah, he needs help. (laughs) And so, like, I mean, I, I assume that's what they do anyway, though, because they're just they just drive around in a caravan. So it's not a power that has come up before, though, of her being like this specific person in this kind of specific place needs my help. Um, Unless maybe they use it. They later. did in the fear machine. So, like, in the fear machine room, she would feel everything that was going on, not when she was in the actual like machine, but when she was in her room, she could she knew that the doctor was going to die and that he like was in love with her. She knew that the guy next door was going to like put scissors in his eyes. Quick. That was like, like within a close proximity. So unless they're saying like her powers have grown. That's what I think they're saying. And now she can like reach out and find people. I think that is what they're saying. I think there was because of fear machine. I think her powers got more from that. And then also she's older. It's been about what a year or whatever. So um, I think that she has more abilities because even like, um, uh, in this issue, when the dog, when the dad says like to attack her and 
the dog goes to attack her but then she's like hey dog and like the dog's like Rrr, and like rolls over on his belly um oh yeah. the poor dog yeah the dog <laughs> <laughs> yeah this one is not a good one if you like animals i will say that uh yeah completely different from you know dog possessed by a creepy guy to dog obviously raised in an environment where it made it violent but she sort of did like a brain click and got rid of those violent thoughts and made it nice and then that ends up getting you know that, that was yeah it gets it killed <laughs> yeah i don't think she knows that though and i don't she wasn't there when that happened so yeah um hopefully but yeah this story with martin was always like I always felt really creeped out by the dad and how, like how he like, there's that scene where he like holds the knife up to his wife's stomach. Like he's going to gut her, but he's talking like sexually with her. And it's like, that's creepy. Like (laughs) what the fuck? (laughs) That's that's pretty messed up. Yeah. That. And then he's just a terrible person. Anyway, this is like, it gave me feelings. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you can go. Oh, well, it, it gave me feelings of like that one with the town where everyone just like became their innermost urges of. Yeah, except there's no magic in this one. They this guy is except just there's creepy. no magic. He's just, he is just that. He is just whatever he is feeling and whatever he wants to do. He just does it. He's just already completely. But like, I mean, that level of like ick factor, yeah. <laughs> horrific ick factors, like they were calling back to that. Or at least with that, you know, there was a reason behind it. There was, you know, that technically wasn't those people. I mean, it was, but it was like them being released from all their inhibitions. But this is just like, oh, by the way, this guy is horrible and he does everything those people in that town do, but without any, you know, <laughs> without well, prompting just him. Yeah. yeah being without, a horrible person. Without any magical spell or weird thing, he just, he's just a terrible person in general. So, I mean, whatever traumas he obviously went through as well because of the whole end creepy trip that uh, Murphy put in his head. Whatever those deep seated oh, yeah. things are, obviously there's some horrible shit there that I'm kind of glad they didn't go into because it lets you imagine like, oh my god, what has he done? I think you can <laughs> What's guess. What's he done to him, and what has he done? <laughs> yeah, I think you can guess what he is in his mind by what happens where, you know, there's like the sexy pig lady carcass, and then I don't know. In my mind, I'm like, so he really like puts the idea of like dead thing and sex together in his head so i thought it was more of like a combination of like women are pigs or women are oh yeah it could be that too that is yeah i mean he literally (laughs) says that a couple times where he's like yeah they're just chattel for us to like do what we want with them so um yeah i mean that's definitely there but like even if it is that why is it a dead pig (laughs) like and i think maybe he killed his mom oh oh yeah because he calls her mom right right so yeah i think he whatever situation he came from he obviously thought his mom was a pig you know maybe she slept around maybe she you know did things that he thought were dirty or disgusting even if they weren't in his brain whatever his brain uh was getting the information of of things there's obviously some weird contrast between what might have been actually happening and what actually happened it or it could also be that he did just come from a horrible childhood as well but either way there's definitely a connection between uh he thinks women are animals specifically pigs and he probably murdered his mother and cut her open like he would like cut open a pig to yeah. take its insides out would be my guess is, is that is i never thought images. of that that is a good uh <laughs> Uh, uh, analyzation <laughs> of that uh i never picked up on the like oh it, he's talking about literally his mom i thought he just had like mommy issues in general but yeah it makes sense that if he killed his mom and then that pig comes back as her, as her in like weird fetish clothes and stuff yeah like that's probably how he saw her <laughs> yeah but yeah that that one i always love the ending of that because he really gets his although i kind of wish it wasn't uh because at the end the mom they pick the mom up in the van and they're like oh where's your dad or she or martin asks her where's dad and he, she says oh the cops took him away because he was like i woke up and he was inside of a pig carcass crying or whatever and i kind of wish it was real like there was a pig monster that killed him and like you know tore him up or whatever but i guess you know he didn't want to. I mean, it was all in his head for Mercury. I would have been more satisfied if he had somehow just like either strangled himself on the pig's guts because he was climbing into it. Uh, or I just would have wished he'd been found dead instead of like mentally scrambled or whatever. Because then 
he's still alive. He's still, you know, whatever kind of help they try to get him or, or whatever gets to potentially be redeemed or at least live the rest of his life, even if he's like mentally scrambled or whatever. But I would have loved just sort of the finality of like, and then they found his body like way into a pig carcass. Yeah, because fuck that guy, right? Or something. Exactly. Like, it, I would have preferred that personally. <laughs> yeah, me too, I think. But I don't know why they pulled the punch. Maybe because, you know, Martin would have been sad or something. So maybe they didn't want. Would he, though? His dad does like beat him and tried to pretend like he was, but possibly would have like actually like gutted him like a pig. Well, I think the weird him. thing Forces is. Forces him to meet all the time. I mean. Yeah, the, the weird thing is, though, I'm sure Martin. You know, like a lot of children who have abusive families when they're little or they're younger, they have that like they need the they want the approval of that parent that's beating them and stuff. Um, and they need it like they crave that. And so maybe he would be sad at first until he realizes and works through all that stuff when he's an adult. But he's only like 15 or something. Right. So plus he did almost beat his dad to death, which Mercury stopped him from doing. Oh, that's that. true. Yeah. Yeah. You're right about that. I think him actually learning that his dad was dead might have taken a weight off of him of like I don't have to deal with him anymore as opposed to now he's like well technically his dad's alive so now he has to think about oh will I ever get redemption will I ever be able to talk to him and ask for like a like an apology or something when his yeah. brain is all scrambled or whatever but well you know, you know what <laughs> now that you said that Mercury you know Mercury is the one who did it to him so maybe that's why she didn't mm -hmm. have him kill himself or something because just like she stopped Martin from killing him with the bone. Oh, that's true. It's like, true. oh, she she just scrambled his brain, made him useless, and mm -hmm. uh, you know took away took away all the evil compulsions in him or whatever. So, hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully. like hopefully he doesn't in his scrambled state try to like gut people. He thinks he sees pigs now, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think Mercury wouldn't do that to him, uh, <laughs> even like that. But you know, I mean, I don't hopefully think he comes she back. neutered his brain, and then he's just yeah, just like drooling in the corner muttering about pigs or something yeah 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 that's what we you know what sure why not that's what happened because it doesn't ever come up again so <laughs> at least that i've ever read I, I have not read anything that references that i don't think so um and then so after that story arc which is you know one of the creepier weirder um storylines to me he does like to go like like up to like highbrow sort of like fear machine like oh this mental craziness and then down to like yeah people getting you know slaughtered yes and a guy who's obsessed with pigs and like slaughtering pigs and meat and things and then back up to oh by the way john had a twin in utero and killed him <laughs> yes yeah so like yeah we go from this story which is really easy to wrap your ha head around and maybe that's why i did it to one of the most like hard to describe and read and understand stories like i have gotten people you know f that listen to this on patreon be like wait what happened like <laughs> and i don't know if it's me or like my description of it or if it's actually um you know just the the material itself i think it's the material itself although i'm sure i didn't describe everything 100 percent perfect but um, it was really hard to do these last two issues because one they bring back the whole everybody and you have to kind of like say where everybody is and and like in their mind and in their, their mental place and everything. And then like what, why everybody's hanging out like Errol and Zed and everything. And then mm. the whole, um, all the tarot stuff is very like, what, you know, <laughs> like I don't quite understand all of this magical, th these magical things. And then one thing I did like is the, the vision that John has at the end of the first book, or, which is issue 39, where he like, he sees that cave after eating a bunch of mushrooms and then he like goes into it and it's like the giant female cave. So he's literally like walking into a womb and, um, and yeah, I don't know. I liked the imagery of that stuff. Um, but then, then the next issue was like, what? Like, cause it, you, you think, Oh, I'm going to like go on some journey with John, but then they just cut to once this, the issue 40 starts, this future world where John is the golden boy Magus, not the one we've been following. And, uh, and like all his friends are alive and it's this weird future world. It's still the post-apocalyptic world. Like climate change happened, but, or the world was destroyed by climate change. But, uh, you know, he was able to survive with all his friends cause he's such a powerful Magus. And, um, just like all that stuff was really hard to explain like why, people are alive or who was talking i gotta remind everybody 
oh yeah, that's the person from this issue or that's the person from this issue. So there was a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and then also the weird trippy thing that happens when they go into like where the Magus goes into the weird dimension with our John and he like, they talk it out and then they're like, oh, okay, we're bros now. Like let's fuse back into one. They do like, what's it like a fusion dance and then yeah <laughs> like dragon fusion ball from dragon ball yeah yeah <laughs> and then they like you know they fuse and then now john is whole again so i think the, now they're john john yeah <laughs> yes i think they're they're the concept is there right like it's a cool concept but this is one of those things i'm like just goes over my head like like i think the execution isn't quite pulled off like a lot of jamie delano stuff but i like it i, I like the idea of it it's just a lot of you just have to really understand like magical processes, I think, to get it. So it seems like, oh, yeah, totally. It's like if someone's talking to you about, you know, circuit boards and you don't know anything about it, all this like lingo and, uh, you know, technical words and stuff are going over your head because you don't understand what those mean. So whenever they're talking about tarot or, you know, these, these, these ley lines, yeah, ley lines, mu magical stuff that you might not have the vocabulary for. It's like, okay. I mean, I'm able to pick up some of it, but like a lot of it is going over my head. And that's why I was like, go to Google. If you have questions about this shit, <laughs> cause I don't know anything about this magic stuff, but, um, but yeah, like, I think it is a weird ending to this, this, uh, run. Like it's definitely, I get, it definitely explains why John has so much bad shit happens to him like um that he wasn't a complete person because he strangled the good version of him in the womb but i one thing i like is that the the good version of him in that that dystopian future where it's the the golden boy magus uh is alive he still feels like he's being haunted by the bo the brother he killed so both are are equally haunted they just have massively different lives or like uh, outcomes of of his life choices i guess um, as opposed to just like, oh, everything's perfect for this one and, and everything's shit for the Arjon. Um, it's like, yeah, that's it, but it's also a little bit more complex than that. Um, so what, what do you think about all this stuff? Did you follow it? Did you, you know, did you get it? Do you think you grasp it? I thought going into it that the future we were being shown was because John was on Mushrooms. He was having sort of like a, a similar trip to what Mercury did because she's already opened that door before. But because of the mushrooms, he was seeing a future that could have been. Like, it, what if I had actually been the golden son that had lived instead of my shitty self? This is the future I could have had. So I thought it was literally John. And, like, feeling the way he did with Mercury's future uh, vision. A different future vision of, of what could have been. Because he was already, like, seeing the golden boy ghost or vision of, of that whatever that was so I thought with that plus the mushrooms he was kind of imagining oh if only I could have like he would basically imagine a world where everything he did worked or like or the best possible outcome happened so yes he saves um what's her name from Astra. The demon back in the beginning Astra yes like so he managed to sacrifice part of himself instead of you know losing her he saved Gary Lester he saved Benjamin um, everybody loves and adores him and essentially views him as their savior. He is the Magus. So to me, I, I took it as this is John's ultimate realization of who he could have been. Um, until the other John came in. <laughs> and then I like, wait. So wait, he wasn't this version of himself. This is in fact a separate version of himself, like an alternate reality timeline, not just a mushroom trip thing he was having in his head because the other John talks to him like our John is like, you know, Hey dude, I've been like haunting you this whole time or something, which just seemed really weird. So I, I really thought that I had it in the beginning that I was like, Oh, this is so cool. We're getting like a weird mushroom trip, alternate potential future that he could have had. But yeah, as soon as it started getting into the fact that these were two separate Johns, like they were actually, saying hey these are two separate johns who are both kind of tripping meeting each other and then combining into the one person they should have been which again doesn't make sense because if they were twins they would have been two separate people they would have been good twin and bad twin 
or something. So well, I think I think twins. the idea Evil is, twin. and I might be wrong on this, but I, the idea was there wasn't supposed to be twins, and because there was, like, it was a either like a a, a happenstance that you know th- something that wasn't meant to happen happened, and this perfect he's supposed to be both of them, right? Like so. Uh, each one feels the loss of the other or like the separation because there wasn't supposed to be another one. And then, at, and so when, and then because of that, each one is jealous, you know, in, in depending on which reality. And that's why they kill them in the womb. It's like, Oh, this one's ugly and I'm going to kill it. And, or, and, or, you know, this one's pr- perfect and I'm going to kill it. And so, which is weird because it's also like this baby is conscious inside of the mom. So, <laughs> or these yeah. babies are. But even without that, like I get the idea that he's going for, which is it's always supposed to have been one child. But unfortunately, whatever happened that made it, you know, split and become two, two beings that were like, and this is kind of like, uh, like twins. I think like John is the that's shit. That's what I was thinking too. John is the yeah, shit, and twins. you know the Golden Boys, Danny and Arnold. DeVito and Arnold. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then or like uh, the Simpsons with Hugo who lives in the basement. And oh it's like, yeah, it's like wait a They're second. Kids. Yeah, wait a second. <laughs> Hugo, the good one, was the one on the left side, and then it's like, uh oh, Bart's the bad time. one. Yeah. <laughs> Are you surprised? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So I, I like the idea. Once again, I think the concept is there. It just. Maybe it's because I'm not magically inclined or whatever. I don't know what these rules are or why. Maybe that's something common, like, you know, the lore of certain people, Maguses or whatever. Maybe they're, this is like a thing that happens or can happen, but I don't know. Mm. So it, it just makes it seem like, yeah, 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 this is totally normal. You know, this happens all the time, you know, future or like, 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 yeah, you know. Yeah, I'm not just, really yeah magically yeah. inclined either yeah so i have no idea on that front <laughs> but i did i did like you know how they at the end they have that conversation and then they become one which was always supposed to be at least this is my interpretation which was always supposed to be the outcome originally but somehow fate or whatever stepped in and made two beings and created john's shitty life so um and i think like the idea is like oh if if john had had that good side of him you know inside of him as well he would have not fucked up when he was younger and had the whole thing with astra even though it's our john he still would have been good right so or he would have that like all-powerful magus feel about him and he would probably had a good relationship with his dad and you know stuff like that so like his dad even though his dad was like um sad that the mom died he wouldn't have looked at him as a baby in the you know infant area and been like ugh, get that fucking thing away from me there would have been like the little golden hue and you'd be like oh well at least at least she died bringing this bundle into the world or whatever you know <laughs> it would have been normal right it would yeah have been like a perfect baby that they're even like this baby's so perfect it's scaring me uh, or like oh this baby's so ugly it's scaring me it would have been like it's a normal kid and yeah, yeah maybe looks cute but it had fine. a better relationship with his father yeah so I, I i i like what he tried to do i don't think he fully pulled it off at least for me um and i think other people have a hard time understanding exactly what's going on in this as well but it does you know on a reread you get to pick up a lot of a lot of things you know like you're like oh i didn't pick up on that i didn't pick up on that like that's a cool idea you can kind of like mull it around because it is so uh like tied to this this system of magic that i don't understand everything all the rules of i guess um but yeah the only thing i don't like about this issue (laughs) is the ending when like all his friends are looking for him after he, you know, bonds with his twin and, you know, comes back to our reality and his, you know, Errol and Marge and everybody are looking for him with Zed and they find the card on the ground, the tarot card. And then they find like the rock that looks like a gravestone. And it's like, John Constantine was here. He was great or whatever. And then like, he just, he just disappeared. It's kind of like the end of Fear Machine, actually, now that I think about it. We're like, it is kind of his MO to just disappear and just be like, who knows what happened to me? Bye. Yeah. Maybe I'll see you again. I'm so mysterious. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I was such a weird, I don't know why he ended it like that. He could have had, like, well, guys, you know, I got to go find me own way. Like, you know, 
<laughs> like I appreciate well, that everything. is essentially what he said, just without him actually saying it. Well, yeah, but I mean, like you know, they're friends. They've been, they've known each other for a long time, you know. So, um, you would think maybe he just would. likes to do it to like uh, Mercury and and Marge because <laughs> yeah. he did to them. Well, he told person. Marge like, "I this ain't gonna happen. Like, we're not gonna be a thing." So, um, yeah. He definitely did not let her down easy in the first or in issue 39 of this little arc. So, um, yeah, that was kind of a dick move to be like, it's not going to happen. By the way, where's Zed? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. For real, right? <laughs> that was a bit harsh. That was a bit harsh. Yeah. I'm surprised John doesn't have more lady issues with, uh, with him being like, so yeah, thanks for the couple of nights ago when I manipulated you into sex. Anyway, uh, where's Zed? I'm kind of horny again. Like, <laughs> I am kind of seeing a pattern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah. So that is that's the end of of the Jamie Delano run. So, uh, what did you think of the run as a whole? It starts with where, where did it start again? I mean, I'm talking about the whole run, like like from issue yeah. That's one. what I mean. Like, where was oh, the beginning? It starts with Gary Lester being. Uh, oh, that was the, the whole demon. run. Yeah. Oh, okay. That that was the whole run. I I forgot that he was the one from the very beginning. Yes. It goes through a lot, man. <laughs> Is this the longest thing you've read, other than Sandman? It might. Well, I mean, I've also read like Invincible and. Oh, you've read all of Inv- um, Invincible. Well, I've gotten up to well that and Walking Dead. I've not read all of them. I've read up to, I forget how many issues, not issues. Sorry, trades. I'm up to like, I think I got up to like Negan in the. In oh, Walking okay. Dead. So yeah, you're you're. This is you know, this isn't the longest thing, but it's one of the longer ones you've read. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually for some reason or another I end up getting cut off from a series. Either I just can't keep up with collecting the trades. Or, you know, I just, I just fall away or forget about it for some reason. Um, but yeah, sticking with this, I mean, aside from Swamp Thing, you know, because again, that's another thing I've never actually gone through by myself. Um, yeah, this was a huge chunk of going from the beginning of a character to sort of the end question mark of a character. <laughs> right. You know, whatever happens beyond this, obviously, this is the entirety of this version of John who's been half a person this whole time this whole time <laughs> the whole time yeah i i think um for me i love this run it's it's definitely questionable whether you need to read the whole thing um if you just want to get like the greatest hits stuff so like usually when people say where should i start with john constantine i'm always like well you can read the first 12 issues of hellblazer and then you can jump to issue 41 with Garth Ennis, which is like considered the best run of the series or one of the best. And it's also like a lot of the inspiration for the movie. So um, I usually just tell people that so that you get like the first, you get a good feel for how Jamie wrote him in the first 12 issues and you get all the backstory that you need. And then you know, you jump to Garth Ennis who kind of takes the character and runs. So like, and it makes sense. One thing I do like is because Jamie Delano did this and set up, okay, John is a more complete person now. He's like the, he, like you said, he's kind of what he should have been. He's both sides. He's like the, the, uh, the weak side and the strong side. So he's got a little bit more cockiness in the Garth Ennis run, which sets up nicely from this, right? Because it would make sense that he, his personality kind of changes after these two issues. Um, because yeah, I, I feel like there is a change where John gets a lot more like a little bit more uh, cocky and Magus energy. Yeah, Magus energy, big time Magus energy. I feel he's willing. <laughs> he goes out of his way to really fuck with hell. I mean, he's always done that, but like there's like a particular swagger he's got after this uh, run, and it, I think it makes sense. You know, it, it really does set up. Um, even though like he's still going through like horrible things in his life, he is able to handle them way better than he did before i think um so yeah i i I think this run as a whole is pretty strong even though if you're just gonna if you just want to read like the good parts of hellblazer i never really recommend to read fear machine Uh, i always recommend the like the family man story arc i think that's really good yes i was gonna say that one to me is important because it has more personal history like what you learn in the very beginning 
of the run. Um, so yeah, if you want to skip over Fear Machine, fine. <laughs> yeah. But Family Man, I would say, is would also be up there. Yeah, and then also you get the good, Sections you know, Neil Gaiman part. Uh, you know, the the mm-hmm. Neil Gaiman story and stuff. So, and you get the cool dog story. So. <laughs> yes um but yeah so so i i like this run i think uh, it is very interesting for the ideas that he throws out um but like i said he doesn't always like land those ideas but i i I appreciate what he's trying to do in it um and also like how dark jamie delano gets there are some fucked up issues in this run i feel like i feel like i've read other issues that get pretty dark but considering like the nineties is known for like being super fucked up and like extreme and all that shit, like this stuff to me is way more fucked up than any of that shit. Um, for the most part, I can't really think of anything that's more adult or challenging with concepts and stuff than this run for the time period. And especially since at first, this was just a DC book. This was not a vertigo book until 1993. So there was five years of you know jamie delano's run actually i think you know what is it 12 issues so he only wrote it for just under four years so um that being said like he was barely in the 90s and he's writing all this under the the main dc logo i don't even know how he did that like um there's some really fucked up shit in this run (laughs) and uh i'm surprised they let him do it if you wouldn't I mean, especially if it's just going to be like an on the stand comic. And it was that that you could just pick up and just like, oh, this looks cool. There's a bunch of cute statues running around and they look like giant babies. I wonder what that's about. (laughs) Yes. What could this be? My nephew likes to read comics. He might like this. He's six. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it would not be a good thing um, (laughs) to pick that up randomly. Although I think because it's just called Hellblazer, no one knows what that is. So like newsstands aren't buying Hellblazer and putting it on there. They could, but you know, they're sticking with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, whatever. True. You know. So I I don't think, you know, 7 Eleven was carrying too many issues of Hellblazer, but um at the <laughs> same time, it still was supposed to be under the code and all that stuff. So um it's still surprising that this got away. Like they let him do it. I think because Alan Moore had already gotten away with a lot with his Swamp Thing run. So they're like, okay, these books we're just gonna like let them do what they want because they're selling well and it's cool. Um, but so, so what did you think of Jamie or what do you think of Jamie Delano as a writer and a storyteller after reading this whole run? I really like where his mind goes. And I mean that as both like from the horrific side to the just like crazy whacked out ideas that were presented throughout the run. Like I was always surprised I was, you know, never disappointed, really. I mean, Bear Machine is is long, but it's it's not really disappointing. It still kind of gives you a complete story, as weird as it is, and as long as it is, it's still a great idea. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that I really enjoyed, like, all the stories that he came up with. And then, you know, there are the individual issues as well thrown in there that the guest writers wrote or or maybe you know expanded on his concepts like with the dog one yeah but i i would love to see other things that he's written because i really enjoyed like just the whole the whole thing yeah i know that he so every now and then i'll see like a random one shot that he wrote for dc back back uh, like in the 90s and i always pick those up because they're always fucked up um (laughs) and they're always like really freaky and weird um, they're always for vertigo at that time. So he was always, he's always good for like a, wow, that was a messed up story. Uh, he needs to write horror stories, man. I think, I think he does write novels? books. I don't, I think he writes more <laughs> magical stuff though. I might be wrong, but I know he oh. does write books now too. So I have to look him up. Yeah. Look him up. But, uh, but at the same time, um, like w- would you recommend this run? to someone getting into hellblazer oh totally i i mean i would agree start with the first 12 because that sets the stage and if if it's press for time and like you said the jump from that to garth ennis if most people know him from the movie which is also how i knew him 
and sort of like a mini quick history and then just mean straight to Garth Ennis, which has the connections to the movie, like you said. Sounds like a perfectly plausible way to do it. And then if they really get into the character to then backtrack to after, like from issue 13 to 40 to go through it that way. Yeah. It's sort of like when you suggest a TV show and you're like, okay, well watch this, you know, watch maybe like the first three episodes, but then jump to episode 15. And then you really get like the meat and potatoes of, of like what the series offers and then go back and rewatch like the rest of them up to that just to get people like hooked first. Right. I think it works out like great like that. Yeah. That's basically what I did with this. Like I read the first trade, I think. And then um, I I had read like, even later stuff, I read like the Brian Azzarello stuff, which is in the one forties. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. I want to know more about this. So let me go back and like start reading fear machine. And then I like, I liked the character enough that I could get through fear machine without it. Like bogging me down. <laughs> That's but what I, you want is you want yeah. them to like him enough to get through the ones that you're like, uh, well, yeah, but to be fair, it's, it's only nine long. issues out of 40. So, you know. <laughs> and not all of them are bad or anything. It's just, a long story so um yeah well i'm glad like now you are aware of jamie delano and if you see that name on other stuff like i know he's written was it, i think he wrote animal man for a little bit possibly is it animal man oh, I don't know. Nice. he wrote another vertigo series after this for a while and i was like ooh, i need to pick that up because i want to see yeah. his take on some of those things um but uh yeah like i i love that like you could get into him and you you know who he is now and if you saw his name on a comic you might just pick it up just because it's him um, i probably would just because i'm like oh okay this has his name on it that means it's got to be good yeah no, or weird or good, weird, weird perfect, yeah something. it might open your mind a little bit you know like yeah. it might not be your favorite <laughs> thing but you're it could end up being more like you know the weird part as opposed to the, the scary part or the gross out part, but either way, it's going to be a good story. Yeah. It's going to change your perspective of the world either way. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, it's super awesome that, uh, that we got this far and, uh, now we get to start on the Garth Ennis run, which is one of my favorite runs of all time of all comics. So very excited about that. Um, is there any other stuff that, uh, I missed or anything you want to go over? I am excited to see where all the, best parts of the movie come from yes what the inspiration was for those but um actually i do want to ask you like i asked you before did you have a favorite cover this time oh i i have two favorite covers from this little eight issue run uh that finished up this this whole uh jamie delano run which is uh i love the dog issue which is issue Mm. 32 just because it's so like all the other issue covers are just esoteric and there's you know words written in hieroglyphics in the background and you know it's like it it gives you a feel it gives you an emotion or like a feeling but it doesn't really tell you what's in it the dog one is just a dog biting a a john's head i think or just a person's head and it's like uh uh-huh got it yeah but it's like i liked the straightforward weirdness of that yeah and creepy factor and yeah and the dog is like distorted (laughs) like it's a creepy weird looking dog so that works (laughs) And then I you know there's going like, to be some sort of killer dog in the story. Yes, for sure. Very straightforward. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, one one cover out of 40 that tells you what's in the fucking episode <laughs> or the issue. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but then uh, I really also like the the mirrored issue, which is issue 39. That cover mm. being being like on top that says Hellblazer and then, on, and then halfway down it mirrors itself on the bottom. So it says Hellblazer again, but it's all upside down and everything. I liked that a lot. And I think that if that actually, like, once again, it tells the story of the cover if you know the story. But if you don't, you're like, what the fuck what kind of cover is this? Weird, it's trippy, and it's very unusual. And, and enough for you to go like, what the fuck? And then want to pick it up to find out what the hell is going on here. Exactly. So I, I enjoy that, those two covers. Did you have one that you liked the most? The dog one, for sure. I have to say, just again, because it is straightforward and gives you that feeling of like monster which i do love anything with monsters in it so monster dog i was like cool is it like a werewolf dog is it just like a like an enormous dog obviously it's gonna eat most likely eat people because there's a head in its mouth i'm down for that crazy dog story of some kind yeah it's like cujo i like that my second favorite and it would be first if I didn't like the dog one so much. It would be David Keynes with the four heads on it. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, David Keynes did the art in that, too. 
I mean, normally I would automatically put him first just because I love his art so much, but the dog wins me over stronger than just his name can. So right. I, I did love that cover too, just because it looked so like each face was specific and different and just slightly off and, and weird. I, I really liked how it almost looked like a puzzle, mm -hmm. I love puzzles and, and just kind of showing different facets. I think of it's supposed to be, I think it's all supposed to be John as if it's different versions of him, which also ties into the story too. So right. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I like that one too, but I'm, I just, the mirror one trips me out every time I look at it. So I enjoy that. Um, but yeah, so we will do another one of these once we get into the Garth Ennis run and probably finish the first arc and then whatever, like, I don't know. I don't remember how many, like if there's one shots in between or that kind of stuff in between the arcs, or if there's like two issue story arcs or something, but we'll figure it out as we go. But definitely at least the first arc, which is the first six issues and maybe a couple of the issues after that, if, if there's no like big arc that immediately follows. So, um, Oh, cool. Yeah. So that'll be fun, and uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy. And as always, if you want to sign up for our Patreon and get all of the Garth Ennis run, because I'm basically I'm two issues away from it ending as of today uh, in Patreon. So if you want to skip skip ahead and don't want to listen to the free version, you can go on Patreon.com uh, backslash Plane Trains and Comic Books, or wait forward slash Plane Trains and Comic Books, all one word, um, and sign up there on the Hellblazer tier. And get the entire library I have, which includes, like I said, all of this run and all of the Garth Ennis run. And, um, yeah. Uh, anything else? Any last words, Hoku? Plus the extras that Patreon members also get. Oh, that's true. Episodes. Yes, we get like... Yeah, <laughs> I we, like those. We do those the, are uh, fun. <laughs> the, uh, the special ones just for, just for our Patreon members. An extra main podcast every month. So... Uh, if you have any interest in that, once again, it's patreon.com slash playing trades and comic books, all one word. And uh, with that, we'll see you on the next one. Bye.